of human geography, and that is Dr. Dennis Leinhan, because it is their terminology, so it only makes sense not to go outside of the definitions of those experts from the Westerners who have mentioned these affairs. So the definition of modernity is an emphasis upon rationality and science over tradition and myth, a belief in progress and improvement, confidence in human mastery over nature, a focus on humanism, individuality and self-consciousness, a close association to the birth and development of market capitalism, and a strong reliance upon the state and its legal and governmental institutions. Modernity is a historical process, incremental in its formation. End of definition. And when we look at this definition, you can see that really, it is really the first and second sentences that define it in its general terms an emphasis upon rationality and science over tradition and myth, a belief in progress and improvement, confidence in human mastery over nature, a focus on humanism. What is humanism? Humanism, when it is used most frequently and most commonly, refers to a non-theistic view, meaning it is not connected to any religion, a non-theistic view centered upon human agency, a reliance on science and reason rather than revelation from a supernatural source as some of the religions they believe in to understand the, to understand the world. Meaning it is a non-godly response. It is based upon reason and science. So humanism in essence is the, re is the rejection of religion and God in favor of human ability science and reason. This is the essence of modernity. The Encyclopedia Britannica, I'm not going to read the whole of it, but it mentions from modernity, modernity is to participate or to participate in modernity was to conceive of one society as engaging in organizational and knowledge advances that make one's immediate predecessors appear to be antiquated or at least surpassed. Meaning that the people who live in a state where they believe that they are in the modern times or in a state of modernity, they always think that they are more advanced than the ones who came before them. Based upon science, rationality, modern day philosophies, modern day political theory, political science and so on. So, modernity is a self-definition of a generation. This is what they define it as, even in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Modernity is the self-definition of a generation. It self-believes in its own technological innovation, governance, socio-economics and so on. So when they look behind them in the generations that came before, they see them as not that they, are, that they were unintelligent or that they were stupid, no. They just believe that what they have in their hands in terms of the knowledge that is with them based upon rationale that has reached them or knowledge and information and technology that is in their hands, it is better than that which came before. So then they start looking at those who came before them and they look at them as being antiquated, meaning old-fashioned and backward. Why? Because the people who came before, as we mentioned in the definition of the International Encyclopedia of Human Geography, that they look upon those who came before them and they say that what we're upon today is rationality and science. What they were upon is old tradition and myth. What do they intend by myth? This is like mythology. They believe in a God that they can't see, intangible. They haven't seen him. He hasn't spoken to them. But they believe in what they would refer to as a supernatural force. But as for us, we are advanced because we have, we have gained mastery over nature. So we know, for, for example, they will say that we know how, we know molecular science. We know that when you put atoms together, we get molecules. 
when these molecules come together then you get various substances so they believe that having knowledge of this makes them understand the world around them which is the philosophical discussion on materialism but that's a different that's philosophical materialism that everything is tangible and can be explained even human thoughts that these are tangible these are you know chemical and and electrical signals that are passed through the body so they even defined emotion and love and hate through you know these types of definitions of rationality and materialism in the philosophical sense and so on so this is how we define modernity and to operate within modernity also meant to participate in a belief that one finds a bold contrast between modern conceptions of the cosmos meaning the universe around you and in the world view of the pre-moderns meaning traditional religion or ancient views meaning that people who live in modernity meaning live in modern times and they believe in this idea of the superiority of science and logic and rationality that everything can be explained through theories of science not necessarily the sci the scientific method because that's something else but through theories that they have developed in their understanding of science and technology and information and what they have gathered and what they believe is happening at the molecular level or even at the level of the universe and the solar systems around us so what they believe is that there is a huge or there is a contrast between what we have today modern conceptions of the cosmos and the world view that what we have today in front of us that there is a huge difference between that and of the pre-moderns meaning those who came before i.e. traditional religion knowledge as it was understood before the industrial revolution and the industrial revolution dates back approximately 250 years so what was understood pre-industrial revolution and what has been what has developed from the industrial revolution till today and of course there are other terms that they use pre-enlightenment post-enlightenment and so on but let's just stick to things that we can actually peg down and say this is the industrial revolution the industrial revolution is a, a specific period of time where technology and advancement and engineering and industry started taking place so pre-moderns that had an idea of religion and, and, I, and I'm talking in a general sense not just Islamic you know the world as a whole they believed in the concept of religion and God a creator a provider one that you worship one that you offer devotion to one that you came from meaning that he is the one who created you and he is the one after you die that you will go back to and he will question you this is in their minds pre-modern this is pre-modernity as for modernity itself it made a chasm or it made a, a huge gap meaning this generation always thinks that the generation that came before is antiquated it is old it doesn't have what we have now remember we're not it's not that they're calling them stupid that's not what they're saying what they're saying is that they don't have what we have they didn't have the tools that we have we are advanced so it's not always that's why you don't find them criticizing a lot of the time the ancients or the or the people in antiquity what they're saying is that we know better sometimes they will when it comes to religion they will criticize they will say that they used to believe in a God because they didn't understand the universe. We understand the universe so we know there is no God. For example. Right? They, don't, they didn't understand how the solar system works. And how, you know, these celestial bodies, the various planets, how they move. We understand. So therefore, they didn't know, we know. So their concept of God or their concept of a creator, it was something that they didn't understand so they invented a God. So they believe that mankind began godless. That when, you know, because of course they believe in the concept of evolution. So when these, you know, these, these creatures that, that, that used to roam around in trees and jungles and, 
you know, and eventually over millions of years when they developed into humans, they had no concept of God. This is the ideology of the Darwinian evolutionists. That they believe that man in his, in his original form had no concept of God. He had no understanding of the surroundings around him. So you would eat anything sometimes, you know, they don't cook, they, don't, they just eat, they just, whatever they get, that they are eating it. So over time, to make sense of the environment around them, and the movement of the planets, and the moon when it rose, and the sun when it rose, they invented gods. So they would worship the sun because they saw it as a big object in the sky, so it must be an object of worship. And they worship the moon, and they would worship mountains. Then as they developed, they became monotheistic. Then they started worshipping lesser and lesser gods. So they stopped worshipping stones and rocks and mountains and moon and star and sun. Because these were huge objects in their minds. And they said, no, there must be a creator of these things. So they eventually became monotheistic and they started recognizing one creator. And then they would worship him. And then as they developed in their understanding over generations and generations and centuries and centuries then eventually that they rejected the notion of even the one God this is the, 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 the idea that they have in their minds whereas Islamically we believe that the first creation of man and jinn for that matter that they were monotheistic they worship one God because remember we're not we're not believing and we don't believe in the concept of speciation. Meaning that all of us have a common ancestor. We don't believe in that concept. So we don't believe that there was one simple, you know, life form, whatever you want to call it, unicellular, multicellular, but you know, you can't even describe it as unicellular, one cell. I mean, what is one cell? Because one cell itself, when you look inside of it, is like a, un it's like a universe in itself. So how did this one cell come about? So that in, in itself is a discussion. But nevertheless, they believe that there's a common ancestor, not for humans, for all living forms, all life forms, have one common ancestor. They can't define it, because it's indefinable. How do you define a common ancestor for plants, human beings, birds, reptiles, mammals, fish, amphibians? How do you define a common ancestor? So it's impossible. But they say somehow there is a common ancestor. That common ancestor, through that common ancestor, of course the discussion and the theory of Darwinian evolution is a long discussion. But in essence, through modification, generational or modification through the ages, that this one common ancestor of all life forms over millions of years through a process of natural selection which is in fact random selection that this one common ancestor whatever it was but whatever it was in their minds it is something minute it is something that you probably would not even be able to recognize as a life form today not even in the cellular sense so if you ever look at a cell under a microscope, you can't even define the common ancestor with that. Because the cell itself, if you ever go home or Google it or whatever when you get home, just have a look at the construction of the cell, what the cell looks like. So it is something that is actually infinitely more primitive than even the cell, the simplest of the cells that we have today. But nevertheless, that is the common ancestor for all life forms. Whether in the sea, in the river, on land, whether they're mammals, mammals of the sea, mammals of land, amphibians that are in both land and sea, whether it be reptiles, whether they're hot-blooded, meaning warm-blooded, or whether they're cold-blooded, meaning it is the environmental temperature that warms their blood within their bodies, all of this has one common ancestor. That's what they believe. As Muslims, what we believe is that actually humans have one common ancestor. That one common ancestor for all human beings is Adam alayhi salam. First man and first prophet. 
and from him Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created him with his own two hands from clay and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed a soul in him created a soul and placed it in him and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed him in paradise then from him Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created his mate from the upper part of his rib of his rib cage and that was his wife who is referred to as Eve in biblical scripture Hawa in the Muslim sense or in the Muslim or in the, in the Arabic language and from them both Allah created many men and women so this is the Islamic belief so what did Adam come with did he come worshipping many gods the sun the moon the stars and then no so you see that right from the very asal or the very origin of the affair there is divergence between modernity and between religious texts and I don't just mean Islamic texts because now in actuality when you look at Judaism Christianity and Islam these are the three major religions right? they're not all Abrahamic because the Abrahamic religion is Hanif strictly monotheist the Jews and Christians are not strictly monotheists, so they are not Abrahamic. Because I know this is a term that is used by many Muslims and Jews and Christians. They say, oh, look at these three Abrahamic faiths. No, they are not all Abrahamic. Abrahamic is only Islam. The origin of Judaism and, and, and Christianity was that they should have followed Abraham and not become polytheistic or entered into disbelief with all of their practices and what, whatever the Christians did. Because Abraham did not worship a man. The Christians worship a man called Jesus Christ, alayhi salam, a prophet that we believe in. Right? So, therefore, Islam believes that, and I said, same as the Jews, same as the Christians, and these are the three major religions of the world, Christianity being the largest in terms of claimants to Christianity, Islam being the second largest in terms of claimants to Islam, and then the Judea Judaism, even though it's smaller than maybe some of the other religions, but it has, but they are considered Ahlul Kitab, even though it is smaller than, for example, the number of Hindus in the world. But nevertheless, it is considered to be Ahlul Kitab, because that their scripture, even though they've corrupted it, is rooted in the teachings of that which was revealed to Musa alayhi salam, or Moses, the Torah. And the Christians, they follow that which was rooted in the teachings, even though they've corrupted it, in the teachings that were given to Jesus, known as the Gospels, or the, what they refer to today as the New Testament which we refer to as the Injil and the Muslims likewise have a kitab, the Quran which cannot be corrupted, incorruptible from any direction, even Iblis can't come and, and corrupt it even if Iblis and all of his army came, they couldn't corrupt the Quran because it is something that Allah has protected and preserved so these are the three major religions known as Ahlul Kitab all three are Ahlul Kitab Islam, Christianity and Judaism are Ahlul Kitab all of them believe that the father of mankind and the origin of mankind is in the creation of Adam. From Adam begins mankind. So straight away when you look at modernity, modernity and Islam, there's a conflict. Because actually, we would say that the ancients were right. Because Adam salam was right to worship Allah alone. They say, modernity teaches actually that we don't listen to tradition and myth science, reason, rationale, logic this answers everything and to believe in God opposes rationality ultimately that doesn't mean that everyone who takes a part in modernity disbelieves in God, no because you find Muslims who are who study this this affair of modernity and they try to somehow integrate the two because they want to live in a middle ground they want to live in a buffer zone it's like two oceans are meeting and they say okay we'll live in the middle somewhere we'll take a bit from there and we'll take a bit from there so these are modernist Muslims right these are known as the Asraniyun in the Arabic language these are the modernist Muslims who want to combine between the two but by combining between the two means that you have to embrace if not atheism or godlessness, complete rejection of God, they have to embrace this idea of rationality being superior and reason and science being superior to that which is revealed in the Quran and the Sunnah. Then what do you do with Adam? Because 
the, the idea about modernity and science and putting everything into the lap of science is that at some stage because if humans have, have advanced technologically generation after generation after generation that would mean that Adam alayhi salam did not have the tools or the knowledge to be a monotheist and in fact whatever he was upon could not excel what we are upon today so the problem with Muslim modernists or Muslims who, who embrace modernity they are trying to walk a tightrope but there's always going to be conflict and contradiction in their arguments this is why he won't stand on one side or the other so when he bumps into someone who has studied Islam understands the Quran understands the hadith understands the seerah of the Prophet وسلم, and he understands the message of the prophets who came before Muhammad وسلم, the modernist what does he have to do or the one who embraces modernity what does he have to do he has to say listen I don't want to talk about Islam let's just talk about science let's just talk about rationality let's just talk about reason let's talk about philosophy modern day philosophy such as democracy Marxism socialism feminism radical feminism let's talk about those subjects because he wants to drag you as a Muslim into his comfort zone so now you have to leave what you're strong upon which is revelation and there's nothing stronger than revelation because revelation is from God it's from Allah when the when Muhammad وسلم, spoke in in the hadith or in the prophetic narrations he never spoke from his desires but rather he was speaking from revelation that Allah was sending him how why would a Muslim leave that zone, that comfort zone? Because that comfort zone is haq. Because it's indisputable. If you're a Muslim and you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. So you've affirmed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Lord and the Creator, the All Knowing, the All Wise, the All Aware, the Almighty. There is no one and no thing greater than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of ilm in terms of highness in terms of wisdom so when they talk to you they want you out of that zone why because they don't believe in truths so there's no such thing to to modern day liberals and those who have embraced modernity even amongst the Muslims there is no absolute truth in fact they will talk about the death of truth because they say truth is relative and morality is relative and that's why it's called moral relativism that what is right and what is wrong is relative to the environment that you live in so a hundred years ago something could have been wrong today that thing is no longer wrong based upon environment based upon the political you know the political circumstances that you're living in the generation that you're living in, the scientific advancements that you're living in. So things that you would possibly get imprisoned for less than 50 years ago. Now you are imprisoned if you oppose those. It's flipped. That is the concept of moral relativism. Right? Which is the opposite of, uh, you know, believing in absolute truths. So, when we move into the next definition, which is the definition of liberalism, we'll take the same examples from their sayings, because I don't want anyone to come afterwards and say, ah, oh, you made that definition up. So I don't want to make definitions up. These definitions are their definitions, from their universities, from their research, and from their websites, because they're promoting liberalism. So before they can promote it, they want you to know what liberalism is. So liberalism is the willingness so we've done modernity in a nutshell right even though you could speak for lectures but we don't have lectures we've only got one short session liberalism is the willingness to respect or accept the behavior or opinions different from one's own openness to new ideas when applied to theology meaning to religious beliefs it is the belief that many traditional beliefs 
are dispensable, invalidated by modern thought, or liable to change. This means that traditional ideas and doctrines rooted in culture and religion must change and show openness to modern or prevalent views. Meaning you're living in a liberal environment in the West, whether it be the US, Canada, UK, France, Germany, Australia, because these are, even though Australia is not in the West, but it is, when we talk about West, we're talking about a th an ideology. We're not talking about necessarily a geography. Right? So ideologically, Australia, New Zealand is West. South Africa, possibly West. Right? When you go to the US, that's the West, even though they're on different parts, different, different sides of the world. But this is West, and these are West in the North or the South. Right? Whichever hemisphere that you're in. These are ideologies and concepts. So, in these societies, liberalism is the willingness to tolerate, respect, and accept behavior or opinions different from your own. Right? So you think to yourself, well, okay. So I have to tolerate them. So we tolerate Christians, like we do here. You will tolerate a Jew, Ahlul Kitab. Prophet Sallallahu lived amongst them. And they lived with the Prophet Sallallahu They made the covenant of Medina with the tribes of the Jews. Banu Quraidah and Banu Nadir. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi made treat. They well, okay, this is tolerance. But they mean something more. When we talk about Western liberalism in light of modernity, we're talking about when it is applied to theology, meaning when it is applied to your religions, whether it be Islam or Judaism or Christianity or other than that, then it is the belief that many traditional beliefs are dispensable, meaning you have to get rid of them. Why? Because they are invalidated by modern thought. You used to think that the Sharia is the best to rule the people with. However, we're telling you in modern thought, this is what they're saying, that democracy is better than your Sharia. So now, the law itself within Islam, meaning this could be family law in your own home, or it could be the law of the land. They're saying that modern liberalism means that those traditional beliefs, they are now dispensable. They are no longer suited for the era that you live in. And they are invalidated by modern thought. They're saying, look, modern thought tells you that every person should be free to do what they, what they want, as long as you don't harm anyone else, because that's the principle, right? So as long as you do not harm anybody else in your individual life, then you should be allowed to do it. Meaning as long as I'm not killing someone, stabbing someone, taking their wealth, breaking into their home, and I'm not doing something that they don't agree to do. Everything else is allowed. So you can sleep with who you want, both genders. Right? This is where this idea of transgenderism and gender fluidity homosexuality which preceded that of course because homosexuality has been around for a long time now you can actually you know decide what gender you are identify as whatever you want so a man can identify as a woman still have a beard so if he commits a crime in the Republic of Ireland and in the United Kingdom and in Canada you know an 18 stone man bodybuilder right short hair big beard he gets, he goes to court, he says, I'm a woman. I want to go to a woman's prison. What do they do? They say, so what, what are you saying? He said, I identify myself as a woman. So where do they send him? Woman's prison. So you have men, you know, his name was John. Now he's called Tracy. And he's in a woman's prison. Because he has identified, and he doesn't have to do any sex change, because that's not a condition to... Self-identity is not conditional upon surgery. It's not conditional upon that. They just say, well, how do you identify yourself? And is there someone who can vouch for you? Yeah, my, my psychiatrist. And I'll, I, I'm willing to speak to a psychiatrist. I'm a woman and I want to wear a skirt. So they put him in a woman's prison. He goes to a woman's prison and he rapes eight, eight women. Then you'd think... 
He's just raped eight women in a woman's prison. Surely we should put him in a man's prison. No. This is self-identity. He ident Just because he has raped women does not make him a man. That's the law. That's the law in Western societies. In many states across the US, because US is, you know, they have federal law and they have state law. In many states in the US, in Canada, in Europe, in Britain, in Scotland, in the Republic of Ireland, throughout the EU. So they say, well, how are we going to cope with this man? Just put him in isolation. So he's still in a woman's prison, in isolation. Because he's a woman. And this is, you know, this idea that you must accept even from a prisoner, from a rapist, from a murderer, it doesn't matter. His personal identity and his personal rights trump the rights of everybody else. They supersede the rights of everybody else. So when applied to theology, this is what it means. That whatever your religion is, it's antiquated. So you can see, you know, modernity and the, you know, hand in hand with modern Western liberalism. Or, if it is not invalidated by modern thought, it is liable to change. So you have to now introduce ta'wil and tahrif into your text. You have to go to the Quran, or to the Bible, or to the Torah, New Testament, Old Testament. You have to go to your hadith and you have to revise them. These are the revisionists, right? So you have to now revise your religion. Your religion must fit in with Western liberal values and with modernity. So these are, the, these are those Muslims that you see on TV, in academic lectures, in their speeches, in their writings. They are the ones who are the influencers of the Muslim society. So they will come with their shirt and tie, and they will speak with posh accents, and they will have you know all types of initials after their name and before their name. This is Dr. Professor so-and-so, and this is what he studied, and he's a doctor of theology, and he's a doctor of philosophy, and he's a doctor of this, doctor of that. Can't speak a word of Arabic, but that doesn't matter. Because he, he's not interested in the religion. He's not interested in reading any of this. They won't be able to even mention to you a name of any of these books that are on my left hand side now. And this is just a minute part of what an Islamic library actually is. Some of these books are from 600 to 1000 or 1100 years old in their original forms. But that's not what they're interested in. All they're saying is, any time you come across a text that opposes modern, western, liberal values. What do we understand by modern, western, liberal values in the sight of a Muslim? What we think about is, these are non-Muslims. That's what they are. Let's not be confused. The origin is non-Muslims. The non-Muslims have created these values. Freedom, democracy, freedom of speech, freedom of sexual expression and so on. Right? Right all the way through to the creation of this LGBTQ movement, which are called the Church of LGBTQ. Because it is a church, it is a religion. Right? So, all the way through that, now you Muslims who are living amongst us, and you are politicians, and you are teachers, and you are doctors, and you are professors in the universities in the UK, so you are a professor or a doctor in the University of Manchester, University of Oxford, University of Cambridge. You are in Harvard, you are in Yale. You know, you are in the Sorbonne in, in, in France. You are in all of these academic universities. Go and tell your people that your Quran and your Hadith and your Tafsir of the Quran and everything else, that it must conform to Western values, liberal, modern values. So if you are not going to dispense with it altogether, then at least reinterpret it so it fits in. So now you find these terms such as Islam promotes democracy. That the root of Islam is democratic. You say, okay, how is that? Well, don't Muslims have a choice? Yes, we do have a choice. But what's that got to do with democracy? Well, everyone should be allowed to appoint their ruler and they should be allowed to make their own laws. You say, whoa, the law is Allah's law. Right? The regulations are Allah's regulations. And what the Prophet ﷺ said, what do you mean we invent laws? Well, the people should have a right to express what they want. So they use these academics and politicians, and we have hundreds of them in, in the UK. They're sitting in Parliament today, in the UK. 
Alright? The Home Secretary not long ago was a Pakistani origin Muslim. The Mayor of London, the second most powerful position in the United Kingdom, he's a Muslim. The most powerful man in Britain on a political level is the Prime Minister. Number two is the Mayor of London. Because he controls the London Metropolitan Police and the schools and the colleges and the fire service. London is the capital of finance, if not in Europe, in the world. Or if not in the world, Europe. So when you look at who they've put forward, they want to put forward Muslims as influencers of the rest of the Muslims who don't know any better. So what Muslims tend to do is that they'll look at the West and they'll say, wow, in Britain, there's a Home Secretary that is a Muslim. As far as Parliament is concerned, because the Mayor of London is not in Parliament. right? The Mayor of London is elected, but he's not a parliamentary representative. But the, they say that the second or the third most powerful person after the Prime Minister in Parliament is the Home Secretary. Right? Treasury is number two, Home Secretary number three, then they, you have Defence and so on. Muslim. And there are other Muslims also in the House of Commons and in the House of Lords. These, and then when you add to that, when you go into the academic universities across the UK, across the US, you find Muslims in there, Arabs in there, Moroccans in there, Egyptians in there, Syrians in there. They have been tasked I'm not saying that every single one of them is deliberately trying to destroy Islam. That's not how they work. How do you work? You convince someone so he actually believes what you're saying. Because if you actually believe someone, you don't have to pay him. Right? You don't have to. If I convince you that this position or a certain position is correct, then you believe that it is correct. Regardless of how, many, how much money I give you. Because now you're doing it for the cause, not for the money. Which one's going to fight for you? The one who has embraced your cause will fight stronger than the one that you're paying. Because the one that you're paying, he can be bought by anyone. So if you're paying him $100,000, and you say $100,000 here, go and tell those Muslims that lesbianism, homosexuality, and being queer and transgender, all of these are within Islam. Islam allows that. He says, how much? He say $100,000. He said, okay, give me 100000 then someone else can come and say, I'll give you 150 if you do the opposite. What's he going to do? He'll do the opposite. However, if I indoctrinate him, and I show him that actually homosexuality, transgenderism, you know, lesbianism, being queer, changing your sexuality, even having surgical, upper, surgical procedures done on young children to change their gender. Removing the genitals of boys, for example. Because at the age of nine, he's decided he wants to be a girl. So you find these kind of examples in the US. 12 year olds, 13 years old. Boys and girls having surgery. Genital surgery. It's called bottom surgery, meaning that it's below the waistline. To change their gender. If you can convince an academic Muslim, what they refer to as the elite Muslims, in terms of wealth, in terms of academia, in terms of political influence, scientific influence, if you can convince that top echelon that this is the truth, go and call your community. He is the one who will enter into our homes, enter into our mosques, enter into our political arena to convert the rest of us. Why? Because the Muslim is going to be suspicious of the Kafir. What does he want? Because we've experienced, Muslims have experienced for centuries Western imperialism and colonialism, right? We've seen how they've come to the Muslim lands and even non-Muslim lands in Africa and in the subcontinent of Pakistan and India, Bangladesh, Afghanistan what they did in Iraq and Iran recently and in the older times what they did in East Africa and West Africa to those Muslim countries what they did to Yemen during the British rule Indonesia, Malaysia, China. So we know that these people were suspicious of them, naturally. Because they didn't do anything 
for the benefit of the people living in the country. Everything was for them. So it was a land grab, asset grab, and whatever the resources they could get from that country. And they took it back to their lands, and that's why those lands are so wealthy till today. They're still living on the proceeds of colonialism and what they gained from the countries that they dominated and colonized across the whole of North Africa. There wasn't a single country in North Africa that belonged to any of the Africans or North Africans. Egypt, British. Tunisia, French. Algeria, French. Morocco, French. Libya, Italian. That's practically the North African. Then when you go into the Sahal, like Mali and Mauritania, French. Somalia between Italy and Britain. That's what was happening. You go further south. You have the Portuguese in Angola. You have the Dutch in South Africa followed by the British. They took the world. So it's natural that when they come over in their own person and they try to convince you and convince me, we're going to say, no, we've heard this before. It's been 500 years. We know what you're about. Let's say they send someone same color as you, same religion as you, dresses like you, talks like you, Urdu better than yours, or Arabic better than the Arabs. And he's saying, this ayah in the Quran, it means this. That verse in the Quran, it means that. This is tahrif and ta'wil. So, this means that traditional ideas and doctrines rooted in culture and religion must change. You must change. They don't have to change. Because they haven't changed in 600 years. All they've done is gone forward. They want you to change and catch up to them. Because they think that you're behind. Modernity, remember? Everything that came before is antiquated. It's pre-modern. They're the pre-moderns. Their religion is defunct. Science is the answer to all of the things that they're saying. They're saying, God made that, God made this, God made... No, it's nothing to do with God, they say. Homosexuality. What's wrong with homosexuality? Well, the Quran forbids it. Well, actually, if you really look at the Quran, it was only for one group of people that Allah forbade it. Not for anyone else. And that's because they used to rape men. But if a man consents, then the Quran allows it. See, where do you get that from? This is reinterpretation. They revised the Quran. That's why you find a lot of them talking about an Islamic enlightenment. Just like Christianity had an enlightenment, which basically meant take all of the laws in the Bible, throw them behind your back. And fornicate and have homosexuality and eat what you want and drink what you want. Steal, lie, whatever. So now the Muslims have to do that. But they know that the Muslims are a tough bunch of people. We're tough. Because we actually believe in Allah. Right? It took them nearly a millennia, a millennium really, nearly a thousand years to unroot Christianity from them. But it remains in pockets in the, you know, in the, in the deep south of the United States of America, in parts of South America, in parts of Africa. Christianity is strong still. But as a powerhouse, Christianity is finished. Christianity as a religion is done. It is only a religion by name. Because those in the elite, in the academic arena, the vast majority of them, the vast majority of them in the West, Christianity is lost. They need that for Islam. Why? Because till this day, the Muslims, that they number a huge body. How do you convert that huge body to Western liberal values? Let's bring some examples of Western liberalism. The fundamental liberal ideas, ideals include freedom of speech, say what you want. So, they know that when they began with Christianity, they started making fun of Jesus Christ. Right? So they would start mocking Jesus. They made called Life of Brian. These were movies mocking Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam. Nowadays, they will openly say Jesus is gay. They'll have t-shirts. Jesus is gay. Can you imagine any Muslim walking in any city, anywhere in the world, with a t-shirt that says the same about Muhammad Why? Because Muslims draw a line. 
But if you draw a line, then what happens to freedom of speech? So they did the cart remember they did the cartoons in France and in Denmark about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Muslims rejected it wholeheartedly, except for whom? Except for that elite that they've been brainwashing and indoctrinating for about three generations, who were basically second, third generation Muslims that moved to the West. So they had to bring out these Muslim politicians, these Muslim academics, to say, well, listen, just because you say something about someone doesn't mean that you disrespect someone. Say, so break that down to me. So then they try to explain to you, listen, if you make fun of a prophet, it doesn't mean that you, res that you disrespect him. You're just having fun. What's wrong with having fun? So the jahil, ignorant, uneducated Muslim will say, yeah, that professor said that, and that newscaster said that, and that radio DJ said that. So what does he do? He goes into college the next morning in Islamabad or Lahore or Morocco or somewhere in Cairo, and, he's, and he repeats that parrot language to his classmates. And he says, it doesn't matter what, uh, what you say about the Prophet Wasallam. He is what he is. If we make fun of him, it doesn't change his reality because that's the language that they use. So you can mock Maryam alayhi salam, which they do in their movies and in their writings. They make fun of her, poke fun of her and jokes at her. And they do the same with Jesus. Now they want the Muslims to initiate one against Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Basically just dismantle religion altogether. Because when you dismantle the worth of Islam and its prophet and Tawheed itself and the Islamic belief and the Islamic law, you dismantle it, take it apart and make it seem unimportant. Then of course another value will take its place in your heart and in your home and in your land and in your culture. Something has to replace it. Something has to replace it. So freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion. They say, look, you Muslims can live in our country. Freedom of religion. Worship Allah as you wish. Then the Muslims think, oh, look, in the West, they allow us to practice our religion. But you seem to think that this is particular to Muslims. You could be a Satan worshipper who's a homosexual, identifying as a woman. They'll still accept you. Because the whole idea of liberalism is that there is no right and wrong. There is no absolute truth anymore. So you say to them, tell me the truth. They say, what is the truth? That's what they'll say to you. A Western liberal philosopher will say to you, when you say to him, tell me the truth. Is this a man? Is this a woman? They say, what is the truth? Well, the truth is what is clearly seen and visible and tangible. Experienced through history. They say, no, no. Aha, you see, that's the problem. There is no truth. There's no reality. Well, there's no real reality. Reality is what you make reality. So a man is a woman. A woman is a man. There are no barriers left. There is nothing that is, that is now, that there is no barrier or a line that you cannot cross anymore. Right? So now you have ideas in the West. They used to call it pedophilia. These are men who rape and sleep with young boys. Right? So, all young girls. So, these are grown men in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and they prey upon young boys. Seven years old, five years old, nine years old, ten years old. They groom them, and then they sleep with them. So, this was all, this is throughout, throughout history. In any civilized society, we're not talking about people who are basically subhuman in reality in their mindset. But in any civilized society, whether it be Muslim, Christian, Jew Jewish, even other religions, this was something that was never acceptable. So they say, well, you see, about ho you see homosexuals, they're born homosexual, because that's the prevalent, even though it's not, I mean, they talk about science, but that is unproven in science. Absolutely, in fact, the opposite is true. There is no gay gene. There's no such thing as a gay gene. So this, they used to say, well, actually, it just depends upon your genetics. So there is a gay gene. When we identify it, we'll prove that there's a gay gene. So, okay. It's been 30 years, 40 years. Have you identified a gay gene? No. They've identified everything else, but they haven't identified the gay gene. There's no gay gene. 
They say you're gay in your womb. In the womb of the mother, he's gay. How? There's no such thing as a gay. There's no propensity towards homosexuality. Human nature, man and woman. That the, the, their nature defines them as they move on in life and as they enter into adulthood. So women desire men, men desire women. There's no such thing as a gay gene. But they've accepted that there's a gay gene. Now that they've laid down the premise, pedophiles turn up and they say there is a minor attraction gene. I say, what the hell? What's minor attraction? Because that's what a person, what, what, what's, what is minor attraction? Minor attraction is a pedophile. That's minor attraction. So now there are lectures across universities in Europe where they are justifying the pedophile gene, minor that minor attraction. These are grown men who want to sleep with little girls and little boys. Multiple. Because when shaitan and the way that they operate is that it is not it is a promiscuous it is a it is a promiscuous relationship. So they need multiple partners. And this is why homosexuality has taken off in the West. Because a man by nature, he is the one who is going out there searching for women. Because men aren't selective. You know that if you're men. Men are not selective when it comes to women. Women are extremely selective. That's why a lot of women say, no, I don't want to marry him. I don't want to marry him. I don't want to marry him. And you find a man who say, I'll marry anything. Because men are not selective. Or they're less selective is a better term to use. Whereas women, a woman will say, I want this type of man. He has to be this high. He has to be this broad. And he has to have this kind of a job. Whereas a man won't, won't do that. Women marry across and up. But a man will marry across and down easily and not be bothered. Why? Because men know that they have to go out there and seek the woman. Because she's not easy to get hold of. So he's sending his mum and dad out every day. Mum, I, I need a wife. Okay, we'll go to that house. Oh, they said no. Oh, we're going to go to that house. They said no. Send a woman out and send her parents out. If you send a man, a, 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 a parents out to 10 homes to find a girl, it's possible that they'll come back after a week. All 10 said no. Send a woman's parents out to 10 homes. They'll come back with seven yeses. Because men are less selective. Right? Because men can produce and reproduce up until their death. A man in his 90s will produce sperm and have children. A woman post 50 is in rapid decline. By 60, she's not having any more children. So a man will continue to reproduce up until old age. Now add to that the perversion of homosexuality. Now you have two males, both of them not selective. What does that do? Imagine what that does to a society. What type of sexual perversion and horror would take place in society if that became widespread? Non-selective men who don't care about what they sleep with, who they spend the night with. Because remember, there's no religion stopping them now. Because we're living in a state and in an era of liberalism, Western values, freedom of speech, freedom of sexuality. There's no God to judge me. Because what do they say? What kind of a God would stop me from loving? That's a slogan. If your God doesn't allow you to sleep with who you love, that is not a God of love. So a Muslim says, yeah, that makes sense. Because he's ignorant. Right? He doesn't know any better. He hasn't studied Islam. He doesn't know, forget about Islam. He doesn't even understand the tradition of religion. And right and wrong and morality. Why? Because he's living in that, in that ether of moral relativism. 
there is no right and there is no wrong and there is no judgment. So these elite academics, professors, politicians, scientists, influencers are reaching you through Instagram, through TikTok, through Facebook, through YouTube. In 30 seconds, 50 seconds, 5 minutes, 20 minutes to influence you. So if you have a society of pedophile men, which they politely call minor attraction or minor attracted males, non-selective, and society says what you're doing is natural, which is, which is the common understanding now in the West. Pedophilia is natural because they were born like that. Because if you can say homosexuals are born like that, then why can't, be, why can't pedophiles be born like that? Because it's understandable to say straight people, heterosexuals. It is, it is correct to say that they're born like that. Why? Because there is that affair that is innate of reproduction. Because you can't reproduce with the same sex. All right? Impossible. If you put 500 homosexuals on a tropical island without a woman, how many generations will they survive? What do you reckon? Zero. Because there's no reproductive capacity in homosexuality, whether lesbianism or male homosexuality. There's no reproductive capacity. So even if you identify from a man to a woman, put him on the island. He says, I'm a woman, lads, it's all right. Can they reproduce with him? Or with it, or they, or them, or whatever pronoun they want to use? You can't reproduce. So it makes sense that in every species of the world, there is a reproductive capability because one is a male, one is a female. One can reproduce and the other can't. Or one can reproduce as a female and the other inseminates as a male. Whether it be, you know, cats, dogs, humans, apes, fish, that capability is there. Once you take the male and a male and you put them together, reproductive capability finishes. But now that you say that homosexuality is normal, it is genetic, you are defined and programmed genetically to be a homosexual. So it's no longer because the Islamic view is what? Homosexuality is learned. Right? Just as a thief learns to be a thief. Right? A drunkard learns to drink and he becomes an alcoholic. You know, you're not born an alcoholic. No child comes out the womb and you say he doesn't drink milk, give him whiskey. Because he's got, you know, because he's got addiction towards alcohol. No, it doesn't happen. Right, putting crack babies to one side because that's a separate issue because that's dependent upon the mother because she was a crack addict but here there is no such thing so we as Muslims believe that these behaviours are learned behaviours that you are not born a homosexual and when you look at society today and the proof of that is that there's been an exponential rise round about take it from 2005 from 2005 up until today, you know, if you look at homosexuality post Second World War, because that is when, you know, liberalism and Western liberal values and, you know, there's 1960s, the, uh, you know, the, the baby boom era, you know, where women are marching in the street and the pill came about. So now a woman can take a pill and not become pregnant. Right. And then the tampon came along. So even if she's menstruating, you know, she can stop the menstruation. So and the pill itself stops menstruation. So now she's got the pill. Now she is given rights. We're not talking about rights of inheritance because Islam gave that 1400 years ago to women. Right of possession of property. Islam gave that to women 1400 years ago. The right to choose your husband. Islam gave that to the women 1400 years ago. The right to separate from your husband through nullification of the marriage known as khula. Allah gave that to the Muslim women 1400 years ago. So that has always been in place in Islam. So what was this liberation that the women were given in the 1960s? They were given rights of, of voting already in the 1920s through the suffragette movement in, the, in, the, in, in Britain and Europe. So what happened in the 60s? That was a sexual revolution in the 1950s and 60s. Through media, through music, through movies. 
media, music, movies. So Hollywood, you know, later on, Bollywood caught up to it. And they spread the same ideology. So they, it became from the 1960s into the 1970s, into the 1980s, a hyper-sexualized society. And underlying that, because as these things were happening and traditional marriage no longer was seen as important and women are given, to, given the right, well, you can sleep with who you want. Who gave them those rights? Mostly men. Why? Because it's in our interests that they sleep around. Because if you're, a, if you're a man who's after multiple sexual partners or that you've lived your life basically trying to get a girl but you never got one. So now you condition her over a few years and you say, just like we have sexual freedom, you got sexual freedom. Just like we can sleep around, which men don't because they can't because women don't agree to it in those days especially. So now these women are told, we are living in open times, we are living in times of freedom, this is sexual freedom, burn your bras. And they literally burned their bras in protests across the world, in the Western world. And they said, we're liberated. Why? Because the bra is confining, it was just, it was symbolic. So now they take their pill and they believe that as they're sleeping around with all of these multiple partners, that this is freedom. But you know what? Women don't like it. Women are inherently, innately monogamous. Men are polygamous. Men can have multiple partners and that's why Islam allows. And in fact, all religious tradition allowed historically multiple wives. And all civilizations, whether Greek, Roman, Egyptian, you know, they, they had multiple partners, but the other way around predominantly, because women are monogamous by nature. They don't like multiple partners. But if you condition them enough over generations, and then you put up women to tell them, yes, go and do what you want. I did it, I'm happy. So young girls and teenage girls are listening to that. So how do I do that without getting pregnant? Take the pill. So in the United Kingdom, in France, across Europe, they were giving the pill to girls at the age of 12 and 13. The contraceptive pill was given to girls in the 80s and 90s. They go to the doctor, 13 year old girl, no parental permission. I want the pill. Here you go, take it. Because it's prescription only. You can't buy it off the counter. So they go to the, they go to the pharmacy, get the pill, they're sleeping around. So Britain, throughout the 80s, because girls didn't know how to take the pill properly, had an, you know, an epidemic of single mothers because they were getting pregnant. Right? So they were taking the pill, but they were missing, you know, because you have to take it regularly. And they were getting pregnant. So as this is happening, just imagine. So this is the trend with heterosexual promiscuity. Underneath that, there's an undercurrent of homosexuals riding the tide with them. Because if you're going to give freedom to women, why not to homosexuals? So, so this is happening underneath. And to a minor level, pedophilia is doing the same thing. It's on the rise. It's on the rise. It's on the rise. But we're seeing the main rise, which is fornication between heterosexuals and women taking multiple partners. That's why pornography rose exponentially through the internet. As soon as the internet came, became big, people aren't looking at the price of gold, silver, properties, and how much is that car online. What they're looking at? Pornography. Pornography is, possibly till this day, the biggest market on the internet. Pornography is not the exploitation of men, is it? Pornography is the exploitation of whom? Of women and predominantly young women. Is that from the side of tradition and Islam and morality? They say, well, listen, we've already told you there is no such thing as an absolute truth. M morality is relative. So now what happens is the LGBT movement comes through. 
right? Homosexuality first, right? So movements start in America and in Britain and Europe and they begin to take over because now the women have got their rights. It's not really rights. You're basically being told to sleep with who you want. So the men have got what they want from the women. Now these men, depraved, now they want the same thing with other men. So what do they do? So they say, we want the same rights as them. So if a woman can sleep around, consensual age of sex was brought down to 16. A 16 year old boy can sleep with a 16 year old girl without parental consent, without marriage. Imagine that, they can sleep at the age of 16, but it is illegal for them to get married till the age of 18. Get your head around that one. It is legal in the United Kingdom for a 16 year old boy to sleep with a 16 year old girl, multiple partners. But if they want to get married, it is illegal against the law. Up and, unless you have parental permission. Without parental permission, you can only get married at the age of 18. Below the age of 16, it is illegal, full stop. So now the homosexuals, lesbians, gay, they're coming through and they're saying, now it's our time to shine. Where's our rights? We live in a free liberal society. That's why now they can shout at the top of their voices without anyone opposing. When we spoke about liberalism, we spoke about accepting and tolerating behaviors. Acceptance and toleration of behaviors included LGBTQ. These are the groups. And then you have the pluses. That's why they got the plus at the end. Binary, non-binary, all different types, right? So all of that came through and now that is the predominant feature in the West in terms of values. That is liberalism. That is liberalism. So liberalism in this sense is fluid. It's constantly under flux and changing, updating itself in line with desires and designs. Designs and desires of who? You and me? No. These are the desires of when liberalism and its values change over time. It's not you and me that are changing them. And it is not your common person living in the UK or in France or in Germany. The one who works in the coal mine or the one who works in industry or the one who's building the house. It's not him who's changing society. So the stake, the powerful stakeholders in society, the media, politicians, big business, the film industry, music industry, sex industry, because sex is for sale. Just look at the billboards in the West and tell me sex isn't for sale. They won't sell a car unless there's a half naked woman standing next to it. An ice cream, a chocolate. So it was these industries, they are the big powerful stakeholders. They are the ones who are pulling, pushing, influencing, bribing, cajoling societies into thoughts and behaviors that align with their ambitions. The more, the more open the society, the more corrupt the society, the more willing the society is, is the more willing the society is, is, is willing to push or to go against the barriers that were traditionally erected by religion and tradition and ethics the more these powerful stakeholders can rise up in the ladder of power and wealth and influence. Because power is intoxicating. I mean, you should know that. We see it in the West all the time. Power is intoxicating. People that you control, societies that you can control. Wealth is intoxicating. Like the Prophet Sallallahu said, you give the son of Adam a valley of gold, he wants another valley. And nothing will fill the belly of the son of Adam except the dust when he dies. That's the son of Adam. Allah's addressing us. And this is even more so with the kuffar. Son of Adam is like that. So how do they, how do these powerful stakeholders in society, media, politicians, big business, film, sex, and the music industry is pushing and pulling, influencing and changing, cajoling societies. But the younger you can start with the kids, the more influence and the quicker you'll convince. 
So they realized that their ambitions have to be spread through education. So they will use media, and I've mentioned the media examples. They will use also news media. Do you think that there is any such thing as news media that is neutral? All of them are influencers. They're trying to influence you with something. When the elections start in the United Kingdom, the general elections, the newspaper organizations that are run by basically two huge organizations, they decide which political party is going to win. It's already done because once these big media organizations choose their party, that party wins. Why? Because everybody else is nothing but, you know, as they call them, sheeple. They're sheep. Whatever the red tags they say, if, you're, if you've ever been to Britain, you know what a red tag is, a red top. So these are the newspapers that are called the red top newspapers. These are read by the masses online and in print press. Education, advertising, school education. So now in the United Kingdom, I'll just use the example of the LBT because we started LGBTQ. So now in every school across the United Kingdom, especially inner city schools, you say, well, why inner city schools? Inner city schools is where the ethnic minorities live. Ethnic minorities don't live in villages. Ethnic minorities don't live in small towns. Ethnic minorities live in the major cities across the UK, predominantly. Right? You do have examples that are satellite towns where they live, but the majority of Muslims live in the major cities. London, Birmingham, Manchester, Glasgow, Leeds. This is where they're living. Cardiff. In these inner cities, all the schools, bar none, state schools, have introduced LGBTQ plus and sex education that is explicit, where they have normalized relationships between homosexuals, lesbian or gay or transgender. So in those books, these are books for five-year-olds and six-years-old. Books of seven-year-old and eight-year-old where two men are having sex, illustrated in a book. Picture cartoon, two men kissing and having sexual relations. Because they say this is to educate the children that this is normal. Two men having sex is normal. Because they know that the fitra of the child doesn't allow for that. Let me tell you something else. The teacher that is teaching them in an inner city school in Britain is from an ethnic minority. Because these schools are like 90%. 80%, 70% ethnic minority, meaning African, subcontinent, Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Afghani, Moroccan, Egyptian, Somali. What's the teacher? White? What do you think the teacher is? The teacher is from the ethnic minority. So the seven-year-old boy or girl, the teacher is reading the story that Abdul Rahman is married to Tariq. And they love each other. Page two. Remember this is for six year olds. So small words, big pictures. Page two. This is Abdul Rahman kissing Tariq on the day of their wedding. And this is them exchanging rings. Page three. This is Tariq and Abdul Rahman with their first child. How did they get a child? It's adopted. Because adoption agencies in the UK will give them children. Page five, this is Tariq and Abdul Rahman lying in bed and they are reading a story to their five-year-old child. Who are they teaching this to? Muslim Somalis, Muslim Pakistanis, Muslim Indians and other religions of course. But I'm focusing upon Islam. This is Western liberal values. You can, if you can get them, imagine by the age of five, you're indoctrinating them. The child finds it strange because it's against the fitra. But he's looking at the teacher. The teacher's a Somali, Pakistani, Egyptian, Moroccan. That's the teacher. The teacher can't be wrong because when you do something wrong, if a, if a seven-year-old do, does something wrong in front of an adult, have you ever noticed what the seven-year-old does? 
He looks at the adult. He wants validation. Is what I did right or wrong? Any of you who have got children have seen that in your children. So as they're sneaking up to something or they're going to take something, ice cream or a sweet, they're doing this. Because they want validation. So dad's going to say or mom's going to say, just take it. Or they're going to say, don't you dare touch that. And he'll go like that. Take his hand, pull his hand back. Because they're looking for validation. So that child is looking at this Tariq and Abdurrahman, husband and wife, husband and whatever they are, right? And the child is like, that doesn't make sense. So what does he do? He looks at the teacher. And the teacher is smiling and continues to read. That's validation. Someone in authority, someone from our people has told him this is normal. So from doubt and suspicion, he begins to accept this. Then he enters into secondary school at the age of 11. Secondary school is just a gear up. Now it's full on. PSHE, sex education, everything. You name it, it's explicit. I, nothing is left to the imagination in secondary school. By the age of 18, when they finish further education at A-levels, they are now defenders of this ideology. They've, you've got, they've lost. Khalas. They started at the age of five. You left your kids with them till the age of 18 without anyone challenging it. They go to the local mosque and they listen to the khutbah whenever their holidays are because outside of holiday they don't go to the khutbah. And that imam is talking about something that they don't understand. And they cannot relate to it. He's talking about something else and in his mind there's something else. So they can't connect with the imam in the khutbah. They can't relate to him. So they go back to school and it continues and continues and continues. Now you find Muslims in the United Kingdom who are openly marching in the streets for gay pride. They have gay pride marches, huge marches. You know what they're wearing now? Now you have women wearing the, the rainbow jilbab in the march. They've taken the Musaf, the Quran, and they've covered it with rainbow colors. They carry banners. Allah is gay. That's indoctrination. That is not reason. That is not thinking. But that is modernity. That is to think that actually those forefathers who came before us, that they were ignorant. We are the ones who are advanced. Whereas in reality, the fact is that even the actual act of, so, of, of homosexuality is harmful. I don't have to go into details. You all know. It damages the body. You're not going to produce a child from it. All types of diseases come about because that is not the place to inseminate, to bring a child about. And that's why Islam forbids it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed the whole nation because of it. Now the reason why I'm using the LGBT because it is a stark, you know, it is a stark image in our minds of where modernity and modernity in, the, you know, in, in their sense of the word and modern Western liberalism where it takes. So this concept of moral relativism that is creeping into our society. This is the idea where there are no absolute truths. You can't, you can't tell me what I'm doing wrong. It's wrong for you, it's not wrong for me. Leave me alone. Oh, leave him alone. We have to be tolerant, brother. Allah says, La ikraha fid deen. So they'll take an ayah from the Quran and they'll apply it in these situations. Because that is the tahrif and the ta'wil, the distortion and misinterpretation of the book of Allah. They'll take an ayah from the Quran, Allah said, don't, there is no compulsion in religion. Rene denko. If he wants to be from, from this group of people, aapko kya hai? Rene denko. Freedom. Doesn't Allah say in the Quran that there is no uh, compulsion in religion? So they are taking verses from the Quran that have got nothing to do with your behavior. And they're applying it. So now when, the, when a 15 year old hears that in school, from his Pakistani teacher, who is teaching him theology, religion, 
He thinks to himself, well, I don't listen to that imam in the masjid because I don't even know what he's saying. He's talking Urdu or Bengali. This guy I understand. He's telling me that this verse of the Quran means leave them alone. So I'm going to leave them alone. Allah's given freedom. Like you find them saying, because kids don't read the Quran. You know, they're sent to the madrasa. Even nowadays, they're not even sent to the madrasa anymore because GCSE is more important than Quran. Right? But even if they are sent, they're beaten in the back hard enough so that they keep this memorization of Surah Al-Fatiha, Surah Al-Ikhlas, and maybe one or two other surahs from the Quran. But they don't understand what they're reading. So this guy comes along, this teacher, and says to him, there is nothing in the Quran that forbids homosexuality. So what does he do? He goes and tells his family, there is nothing in the Quran that forbids homosexuality. Because he's never read the Quran. Never read the Quran. So it is these interest groups that decide what the liberal values are. What is right and what is wrong in a particular period of time. So, sometimes a person may say, well, I know what is right and wrong. I know this is absolutely wrong and this is absolutely right. Like, fornication is absolutely wrong. Homosexuality is absolutely wrong. That's what I believe. Right? So, I am what they call a moral absolutist. I know what is morally absolutely right and wrong. But in reality, when it comes to meeting these people, he'll say, it's all right, you carry on, but I believe it's wrong. But you can carry on. And you hear this often, right? Well, if you want to be gay, that's all right. I just don't want to be gay. Because they want to be diplomatic, pragmatic. They want society to move on. And they don't want to be, the, they want to be see, seen as the ones who are backward, bringing your Islam into our society. This one is not a person who knows the absolute truth and even if he knows it, he is not acting upon it. He is in reality falling for this Western liberalism because he's not willing to challenge it. They will challenge you and they will tell you, you must accept like what's happening now, right, in the Gulf countries. They're trying to force them. When our players come over, they're going to wear rainbow and they're going to do this and they're going to do that. Because they want to impress upon the rest of the world this moral relativism. You have to accept. You don't have to do what we're doing, but you must accept what we're doing. So certain people push back and they say, I don't have to accept what you're doing. In fact, I'm going to say the opposite of what you're doing. Because this is what tradition of the Quran teaches us. That we worship Allah. Worship Allah alone and don't have a and don't associate partners with Allah and be good to your parents. At you Allah wa at your Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. Faliahdari Ladina you khalifuna and amre and to see bohum fitna or you see bohum adabun alim. And let those beware who disobey the Prophet that Allah afflicts them with a trial. Or that Allah gives them a severe punishment. This is what we believe in. These are absolute truths. But if you speak like that, you're seen as what? Antiquated. Pre-modern. Old-fashioned. You're anti-science. You're anti-modern. You're anti-technology. No. Why am I anti-technology? Just because I don't agree with your corruption? These are truths that do not change because our position is rooted in revelation from Allah and what the Prophet wasallam brought. That's page 5 of 27. How long has it been? Hour. I've reached page 5 of my notes of 27 pages. We're going to conclude there inshallah because I haven't even touched on material you know materialism in the in the in the sense of chasing the dunya and chasing worldly possessions. You're going to have to leave that for another occasion inshallah. So at least we've opened the door to the subject of modernity and western liberal values.
we've just opened the door slightly anyway we'll leave it there inshallah barakallahu feekum but don't forget in conclusion the purpose of your creation the purpose of your creation is to worship Allah and to obey him what is the meaning of Islam even the meaning of Islam al istislamu lillahi bit tawhid wa inqiyadu lahu bit ta'a right to submit to Allah by worshiping him alone and to yield to him in obedience and to abandon idolatry, polytheism, and the worship of everything besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To abandon all of that. That's the meaning of Islam. And to obey the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he was receiving revelation. The sunnah of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is revelation, just as the Quran is revelation. That's why you find constantly in the Quran, Ati Allah wa Ati Rasul, obey Allah and obey the Rasul. So okay, you obey Allah, that's the Quran. Obey the Rasul, that's the Sunnah. So bear that in mind upon the understanding of the society, the best of all societies that has been raised upon piety, truthfulness, correctness, obedience to the Lord. For them, the doors of paradise are open on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. For that society, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and whomsoever follows them generation after generation. So don't be deceived by this imagery and these ideas and influences that you receive from, the, from these Western thoughts or these Western ideas and thoughts and philosophies. Barakallahu feekum. Wa jazakum Allahu khairan wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. What time is salah? Oh, okay, khalas. So we'll do a short Q&A ses session. After the prayer, we're going to pray now, inshallah. Zakumullah khair.